Hello Logic people, welcome back to my garage. Today we're going to start learning predicate logic. Predicate logic. In the past we learned propositional logic. And I've written it up here so I don't have to write it down in front of you. Propositional logic is pretty cool. I mean we can do proofs and proofs are pretty cool, right? Um, but one of its shortcomings is that we cannot symbolize categorical statements, at least in a helpful way. Let me give you an example. I'll use a different color pen for once. Um, statements of the form all A are B, right, and that's a categorical statement. If you, if you symbolize that in propositional logic, um, as, as stated right there, you would just say something like A. Um, no A's are B's, symbolize it, I guess, A. Some A's are B's, you'd symbolize it, A. Some A's are not B's, you'd symbolize it, A. Now, of course, A would stand for something different in each of these cases. But you see the problem right here. There's a certain complexity here. All A's are B's. It's not that complex. But that complexity, that logical complexity, the relation between these two sets here, these two categories, A and B, is not really represented here with A. You have to know what A stands for to get that idea. Um, the symbol itself does not represent the kind of complexity this statement clearly reveals. So that's one problem with propositional logic. We are going to learn predicate logic, which is actually an extension of propositional logic. Okay? It's really an extension of propositional logic. So it's not quite like you're learning something new. Of course you are learning something new, but it's not, entire, it's not entirely new. It's adding features to propositional logic to make propositional logic more accurate and more useful. It's actually, you could say, um, it combines, well, it adds some of the advantages of categorical logic to propositional logic. So you could say um, predicate logic is a kind of hybrid between um, propositional logic and categorical logic. So no wonder we're looking at it as our third logical system. It's definitely the most useful. And it's also uh, what logicians use today, really, primarily. They use predicate logic. So let's start learning this. Um, I'm going to begin today by talking about how to translate, how to symbolize statements into predicate logic. And you'll see its power. It goes far beyond categorical logic. All right. I'm going to begin with a simple statement here. Ren is a dog. And you saw a, a video of Ren um, in a couple of these uh, YouTube videos. So let's, let's go back. He's the smaller one, Ren. So let's talk about Ren right here. Ren is a dog. Now, Ren is the subject. Subject. Why? Because we're really talking about Ren. This individual, it's a dog, right? Individual, the substance, we call it the subject, because we're talking about Ren. Now, the predicate here, so we're going to use that language here, the predicate. Do you know what the predicate is? The predicate term would be something like dog, something like that. But the predicate itself is this whole property here is a dog, being a dog. That whole thing right there is the predicate. Okay, And the idea is this, the predicate in some way or other belongs to the subject. The predicate belongs to the subject. You could say, in a sense, of being a property of the subject. Okay? 
it's a property of the subject. Some, some might say the predicate is included in the subject. I'm not, we're not going to go that far. Okay? So we're telling you something about the subject right here. Another way of putting it is that it's, it's an adjective that describes the subject at hand. Ren is a dog. Let's symbolize in predicate logic the statement, Ren is a dog. It will look like this. Check it out. D, capital D, little r. Doctor, no. Um, D, R. Okay, so capital D here is the predicate, okay? The predicate is a dog. And in general, capital letters will stand for predicates. And we'll write that down eventually. Okay. Lowercase letters, this little r right here, stands for individuals, individual subjects. So in this case, the subject. And here we have an individual, Ren. Okay? And the way it's set up is almost like um, D right here is the adjective modifying or describing the subject. Put it in that order. Okay? Um, what does this mean? Dogness, right, modifies or describes that being Ren, that individual Ren. Okay, so um, this is our first symbolization in predicate logic. In propositional logic, Ren as a dog would just be symbolized as capital R. Do you see that? That's not as, uh, yeah, that's not as subtle, that's not as, that doesn't quite capture the complexity of the, of the logic right here, is it? Does it? Um, DR. That's closer to what's happening here. So it's a more accurate symbolization. Okay, so let's, let's uh, symbolize a couple more statements right off the bat. Um, what about this? Ren is not a cat. How do you think you'd symbolize that or should symbolize that? Well, you're still talking about Ren, so you're gonna use a little r right here, lowercase r. Now, not, it's a negation operation, right? Um, you're going to use a tilde. So, it's not the case that, now you're going to say something about R. What are you going to say about R? Well, R, Ren, is not a cat. Now, that's a predicate. The predicate is, is a cat. You're negating that. So, it would be not, capital C, R, not, C, R. So, if I had a dictionary, right? R stood for Ren, um, C stood for is a cat, uh, capital D stood for is a dog, and then I saw this symbolization, not CR, I would know exactly what it meant. It would mean Ren is not a cat, or right? catness does not belong to Ren. Being a cat is not one of Ren's properties. All right, let's talk about my other dog, Stan. Okay, so Ren and Stan are dogs. Can you guess how to symbolize that statement? You're talking about two individuals, so now you're going to have another individual here, small s here, although Stan is not that small, but right there, Stan. And we're talking about being a dog. So can you guess how to symbolize that? Okay. Now you might be tempted to do something like this. Dogness belongs to Ren and Stan. DRS, right? That's not a bad guess. And, it, and I guess predicate logic could have gone that way. But actually it turns out um, 
that's not the way logicians symbolize Ren and Stan are dogs. Um, the way they do it is like this. Here, Ren and Stan are dogs. You're making two claims about the universe, aren't you? You're saying Ren is a dog and Stan is a dog. DR and DS. You follow that? Okay, let's do something a little, maybe a little bit odd, but let's do it. I think you could probably symbolize it accurately. If Ren is a dog, then Stan is two. Stan is as well. Yeah, there's some truth to that. Okay. Um, how would you do that? Well, first of all, you don't need any more predicates. You don't need any more individuals to talk about. You're still talking about Ren and Stan. You're still talking about dogness. But now we have a different logical operation. So you'd say something like this. If Ren is a dog, right, then, or you could say dr arrow ds. Okay? If Ren is a dog, then Stan is a dog. If we use transposition, we will get this. Not ds, arrow, not dr. By the way, the same rules of inference will be used in predicate logic. Remember, predicate logic is an extension of propositional logic. So if Stan is not a dog, then Ren is not a dog. That is just a transposition of this original statement. It's equivalent to it. Now, what if you wanted to say all dogs are mammals? Now, you're not going to run through every single individual dog. You don't even know all the individual dogs. Ren, Stan, Spot, Lucy, Josephine, or whatever. You know, um, go through all the dogs in the universe. No. So you're not going to refer to individuals in this kind of case. You're going to make a universal claim. You're going to talk about the whole category of dogs. Predicate logic has a way of doing this. And it uses a symbol to stand for all or to tell you that the statement will be universal. It's an upside down A, like this. And it means for all. Oh, let me not, I'm not gonna put in that X yet. You'll see that, that's gonna happen soon. For all. Just bear with me. This is a little bit tricky. Um, this is what makes predicate logic look a little bit hard to handle, a little bit scary. But once you learn it, it's not, it's not too bad. It looks scarier than it actually is. Let me look, let me show you the cover of this book, you know, our textbook, An Introduction to Logic. Let's see if you can see this here. If you look at this proof on the front cover, look at some of the symbols right here. This is all in predicate logic right there. Okay, so that's what we're learning right now. Okay, so if you want to say all dogs are mammals, this is the way we do it. And just bear with me, we're going to be using variables and predicates. For all, what we do is this, we say for all x, so it's upside down a, x, for all x. Again, I'm just going to symbolize this and then we'll get more official, all right? For all x, if x is a dog, if the predicate d right here is a dog, belongs to some individual, any individual really, for all x, if that thing has dogness, then it's a mammal. And you put the parentheses right here. So what this is saying right here, let me, I'll write it down. For all x, if x is a dog, 
sorry, let's write down dog here, is a dog, then X is a mammal. This is the way um, the A statement, all dogs are mammals, the standard form categorical statement is expressed in predicate logic. Let's do one more right here. Let's do no lizards are mammals. Okay? No lizards are mammals. The way it's done is this. Against the universal statements, you're going to begin with this upside down um, A. By the way, this upside down A is called a quantifier, a sp and specifically a universal quantifier. Why? It quantifies over a range of things. Okay, It ranges over a group, a category. It quantifies. And it's universal because it ranges over the entire group, the entire subject to your dogs. Okay, so for all x, if it's a lizard, LX, then it's not a mammal. It does not have that property, that predicate of being a mammal. So right here, we have just symbolized both A and E statements. And I would memorize how this is done right away. Before you even fully understand it, memorize this form here. So anytime you see a categorical statement, all right, of this form, A, you can plug it in, you can figure out its symbolization very fast. Same with E right here. Now let's symbolize the statement, some dogs are extremely fast. stands pretty fast. That is an I statement. Okay? Um, now, we're not talking about all dogs, right? We're talking about at least one dog. We're not making a claim about the whole set of dogs. So we're not going to use a universal quantifier. Now, we are quantifying over a category. Um, and we're saying, again, at least one dog is extremely fast. The symbol we use is a backwards E. It stands for, for some. And we're going to use uh, variables like we've done over here. For some X. For some X. X is both. This is the way it should be done. X is both a dog and uh, let's do extremely fast. Let's let's use F as the predicate term here, um, the predicate letter here. DX and FX. For some X, X is both a dog and extremely fast. Okay. It's called an existential quantifier. Because you're making an existence claim. You're saying there's at least one thing in the universe that is a dog and extremely fast. Universal quantifiers do not automatically make existence claims. You're saying for all x, if x is a dog, you're not saying um, that there are actually any dogs. Now, you might, you might be, but you're not committed to it when you symbolize in predicate logic like this. Okay? Like I could say, all unicorns are silver, or all unicorns are magical or something. Um, for all X, if X is unicorn, then it's magical. But I'm not saying, I'm not committed to the existence of unicorns. Going back to this, it's important that you use the ampersand right here. So imagine if you symbolize it this way. For some x, d 
dx arrow fx. Okay, let me tell you what that means, or you can probably guess for yourself. This actually means for some x, if x is a dog, then it's extremely fast. For some x, if it's a dog, then it's extremely fast. You notice that that's not saying that any dogs exist. That's not saying there's at least one thing in the universe that is an extremely fast dog. But this statement does. This is an incorrect, this is a faulty translation or symbolization of this I statement. Time, time to symbolize an O statement. Some dogs are not extremely fast. Existential quantifier for some X. X is a dog and, you could guess here, it's not extremely fast. Okay, see that? Now let's summarize a little bit right here. Talk about our, uh, our syntax, our grammar. Predicates such as right here, capital D here, capital F, yes, D and F right there, will be represented by capital letters. A, B, C, and so forth. Okay, predicates. Um, I've been talking about individuals. Let's call those technically here individual constants. Such as Ren and Stan. Those will be represented by lowercase letters. A, B, C, and so on. Okay. Oh wait, that's misspelled. Constants. Okay, lowercase letters. A, B, C. Except for X, Y, and Z. Those will be reserved for individual variables. And see, we've used them here, x right here. Sometimes we'll also use y and z. Individual variables, those will be lowercase letters, specifically x, y, and z. And then finally, we've talked about using quantifiers. Quantifiers there. And we only have two in our system. We only need two. We have the universal quantifier. And that was represented by this upside down A. And it's never by itself. You don't have an upside down A by itself. It's always tied, right? to a variable here for all x, or for all y, or for all z, right there. So that's a universal quantifier. And then you have the existential, the backwards e. Again, always tied to x, y, or z. So these are the, the four elements of our language and propositional logic. Well, of course, we also have operators, right? But we've already learned that. We have the operators. Might as well put this down. Um, the tilde, the ampersand, the wedge, the arrow, and then the double arrow. Okay? So this is part of our language. This is what our language holds with, um, within it. And from, with all you know, these pieces of our language, we're able to symbolize a huge range of statements. So what I'll, what I'll do next is just go through some more examples 
and we'll translate those. That's nice. Here are four statements to test you with. Mountain lions are dangerous mammals. Nothing is a unicorn. If all dogs are fast, then Ren is, Ren is fast. All donuts and fritters are pastries. Okay? Mountain lions are dangerous mammals. The first thing to keep in mind is, is think about what predicates are involved right here. Also, how many predicates are involved? Okay? Um, what is the subject? Mountain lions. It's not two subjects, it's not mountains and lions, right? You're not talking about mountains, you're not talking about lions, right? As opposed to lions, you're talking about mountain lions. So let's call that um, the predicate capital M. Is this a universal statement or existential statement? It's talking about all mountain lions, isn't it? For all X, if it's a mountain lion, then, okay, now ask yourself, how many predicates are involved right here? Is it one, dangerous mammal, or is it two, um, the, pre the predicate or property of being dangerous plus being a mammal? I think that's probably the right way to take it. For all X, if it's a mountain lion, then it's both dangerous and a mammal. Now, you don't want to use capital M again. Maybe we should have used capital L right there. But since we already put the M down here, let's just, I guess, put down, uh, I guess you could put down capital A here, right? Mammal, that's a little odd. But as long as it's all clarified exactly what the dictionary is, it should be fine. So, let's do the parentheses correctly right here, okay? So, for all X, if X is a mountain lion, then it's both dangerous and a mammal. Nothing is a unicorn. That, that doesn't fit a standard form categorical statement. So you've got to think about how to express this. How to express this. Um, nothing is a unicorn. Well, that's denying that something is a unicorn. So you'd say something like this. It's not the case that something has the property of being a unicorn. It's not the case, or it's false, it's false that for some X, X is a unicorn. Does that follow? Now you might think of another way to symbolize this. Maybe for all X, it has the property of not being a unicorn. And that would be correct as well. It turns out that these two are equivalent with each other. And we'll talk more about that later when we get into proofs. Okay, nothing is a unicorn. If all dogs are fast, then Ren is fast. Okay, this is a little bit tricky. This is a little bit tricky. First of all, you've learned how to symbolize this statement, all dogs are fast. So let's write that one down. For all X, if it's a dog, then it's fast. Okay, so that's that right there will be plugged in for all dogs are fast. But wait, there's an if in the front. So this is gonna to have to be an antecedent in a conditional statement. So arrow. Now it looks like you have to do parentheses around this one, aren't you? Well, no, actually you don't. Should be fine. If you have to add it, you will. Let's do this, that's, that's good enough like that. If all dogs are fast, then Ren is fast, okay? No quantifier is going to be used here. Why? Because you're talking about an individual constant right there. So you're going to say FR. If all dogs are fast, then Ren is fast. Interesting, huh? Okay. Let's see. See how this definitely goes beyond categorical, categorical logic. All donuts and fritters are pastries. Have you worked on that? Try and do that one. Begins with a universal quantifier for all X. Okay. What do you think the answer is? Let me give you an incorrect answer. For all X, if X is a donut 
and a fritter, then it's a pastry. Okay. This actually does not say the same thing. For all X, if it's both a donut and a fritter. Now, let me just tell you this. I love apple fritters. I love apple fritters. But I don't really call apple fritters donuts. It'd be very weird to find something, right, that's both a donut and a fritter at the same time. And let's say you did. Even if you did, that's not, I don't think, what this statement is saying. This statement is saying, if something's a donut, then it's a pastry. And if something's a fritter, then it's a pastry. So there's a couple of ways you could symbolize that. You could say, if it's either a donut or a fritter, then it's a pastry. You could also do something like this. You could do, for all x, if it's a donut, then it's a pastry. And, hey, for all y, if it's a fritter, then it's a pastry. You see that? Okay, I'm going to make one more point with regard to this one right here. For all x, let's, let's say we do it this way. dx or fx arrow px. Okay, now let's say you forgot to put the parentheses around this or you didn't realize you had to. Let me read out what this says. This says, if everything is either a donut or a fritter, see that? If everything is either a donut or a fritter, then, now, x right here, is not functioning as a variable anymore because this is not ranging over it. It's not finding it, in other words. So that little x right there actually becomes an individual constant. So I will, I will ask, what is, who does that stand for? What does that stand for? Are you saying Xerxes is a pastry? That's what I'll be expecting. Are you talking about some kind of individual, some kind of thing? Or you could say then that xylophone is a pastry or something. If everything is either a donut or a fritter, then Xerxes is a pastry. See that? That is not the same thing, that civilization, as this all donuts and fritters are pastries. So you have to watch out for that. If it's a variable, it's got to be bound. No, there are no floating variables in our language. It makes no sense. They are all bound, in other words, by a quantifier. They're all quantified over. Okay? A couple of more examples. Joe is a vicious weasel. I think you can symbolize this. You're talking about an individual constant, Joe, right there, lowercase j. Um, what are you saying about Joe? Yeah, you're saying a couple of things about Joe, or whoever's saying this. You're saying Joe is vicious and Joe is a weasel, okay? Capital V, J, and W, J. Make sense? All right, let's do another one. That looks very similar, but not quite, you'll see. Joe is a large weasel. Now, you might be tempted to symbolize it much like that statement, much like you symbolize this statement, okay, by separating out two predicates here. 
that Joe is large and Joe is a weasel. But think about that. That's a little bit odd. Um, because how big is Joe? Joe is, I don't know, like this big. Okay? So he's large as far as weasels go. But it's not like he belongs to the set of large things. Like, I'm not a large human. I'm not a large human, but I'm a lot larger than Joe. Joe's like way down there. I'm way larger than Joe. So, it'd be very weird if Joe belonged to the set of large things, but I didn't. And he's shorter than me, right? He's smaller than me. Um, so, this is not the right way to symbolize this. The right way to symbolize this is just WJ, where W, capital W, stands for, right, is a large, is a large weasel. That's what it means. Okay? Large modifies weasel. It's relative to being a weasel. It's large as far, far as weasels go. Now you might say, well, what's the difference, is, what's the difference here? Um, are we talking vicious as far as weasels go? Nah, have you ever seen a weasel? I mean, it's, it's viciousness is like, I'm not saying all weasels are vicious, but when a weasel's vicious, its viciousness is similar to our viciousness. So it makes sense to say that Joe belongs to two sets, right? The set of vicious things or vicious animals and the set of weasels and that Joe is in the middle right there. It's very odd to say something like the set of large things, the set of weasels and Joe is in there. That makes no sense. Large is relative, right, to the term it's modifying. Vicious doesn't seem to be. Vicious is what is called Here's a new word for you, an intersective adjective. That is, it points to another set. So an adjective, right, it's, what we're doing is connecting sets together. It's one way to look at it, interse intersective. Whereas large is non-intersective. Now, I try to give pretty straightforward cases here, but it gets, it gets very tricky. It gets very tricky. Um, for example, the term beautiful. <sighs> Is that intersective or non-intersective? Plato thought, Plato thought it was intersective that the standard of beauty applied to all things, the same standard applied to all beautiful things. It's not like beautiful as far as houses go, beautiful as far as music goes, beautiful, beautiful as far as paintings go, and it's all a different sense of beauty. No, for him, it's all the same standard or sense of beauty. Now, beauty beautiful is like vicious in that sense. There's one standard of viciousness, and it applies to all categories. So I'm actually not going to give you any examples that use beautiful because it's very controversial whether or what kind of adjective it is. I'm going to try to give you uh, some pretty straightforward ones. Okay? So for example, if you say something like Metallica plays metal music, um, Metal here would be, I think, non-intersective. It's, it's describing music right here. It's not like Metallica belongs to the set of metal things. I mean, they don't even wear armor, right? It's not, it's not like they belong to the set of metal things and playing metal as opposed to music or something. No, it's metal music, metal as far as music goes. Okay? Wow, that was a loud car out there. All right, does that kind of make sense? Um, you're going to need some practice. Do as many examples as you can from 
from your text. I'll try to make up your own examples and see if you can translate those. Uh, but I think that's enough for today.